Harry Potter on, on the comments on my yeah. thing. He's, he's, a, he's a mentally good. unstable yeah. uh, individual. Yeah, I mean, I want to first differentiate, just you remember my dad was a psychiatrist, so I'm I'm not out to, you know, vilify the mentally ill. It's, it's not about that at all. You have a, a great empathy, but my soccer is mentally ill, but he's also very dangerous, so that has to be said. And sort of in telling my story back in 2011, uh, I was one of the LA Weekly People of the Year. I'd opened up an art gallery, and he had been stalking Ivanka Trump out in New York. He's from a, a wealthy family. He's a young, schizophrenic guy. He was very, very bright, had a lot of things going for him, but mm -hmm. his mental illness just really took over. And so um, he had jumped bail in New York. He came to LA. He took us to LA Weekly. He saw me, became fixated. He came to my gallery. He was wearing a space suit, and I thought it was like a fun Andy Kaufman art prank. I have like a real high tolerance for that stuff. So right. I engaged him in conversation. I could tell he was really bright, but quirky. You know, And the more that we started speaking, he said stuff like, oh, you remind me of Jessica Rabbit. I'm like, okay, thanks, I get a lot. And then he's like, oh, I'm gonna stop you. And now it's chilling, but at the time I thought he was just you know, kind of being weird. And I kind of kicked him out of the gallery and didn't think anything of it. And then a few days later, um, the Trumps had hired, remember those 2011 Trumps had hired bounty hunters to extradite him and take him to trial at Rikers in New York. And then he was you know, put into prison. He started writing me these crazy handwritten letters. And at first they were just like, just weird ramblings. I didn't really think anything of it. And then they started escalating to very, very graphic rape and death threats, like incredibly graphic. And then I went to police and they said, well, he doesn't have a fixed address, so you can get a restraining order, but you can't serve him. So that's problem number one. People don't realize that, you know, all you do is just go in and serve a door. You evade the process server. It's never been served. And so one of the things I'm trying to do is the ability to serve a restraining order via email because we have legal precedent. You can have a foreclosure notice over email. We have, you know, stuff which can show you that there's a rape receipt and someone's gotten it. So that would certainly help change the game. But yeah, he's even, he's yeah, so talking you through it. Right, so you should be able to return a protective order that way. So anyway, so for years, I'm just sort of living my life every day. I get a rape or death threat. I learn to check the IP address so I know where he is, so I know what level of danger I'm in. If he's out of state, I can breathe. If he's in California, I'm on high alert. And they sort of, you know, normalize this, and then normalize. It's just wow. like that's all you all you can do, you know. It's bizarre to even think it's that so it's so bizarre. Is it normalizing? Well, but you said you know you normalize it too. Well, yeah, so that's true. And, and even after I left television, uh, there there were several incidences. One involving also a, a mentally uh, unbalanced guy, who I thought I was, you know, in no danger from, but when he started to throw things over my fence when I lived in Venice Beach. Um, he started to throw personal things over my fence and letters, and it got very, very weird. Ultimately, my son served him on his bicycle, but it had to be done physically, yeah. like you said, in person. And uh, we, we got him put into a mental health facility, um, where he subsequently hung himself. And when the DA, uh, Wendy Siegel was her name, she oh, was know wonderful. Yeah. You know Wendy, yeah. she deals with this. Yeah, yeah. And she just was up for judge. <laughs> yeah. She's a I love her. Yeah, she's cool. Yeah. She, uh, she called me when she learned this, and she said, will you sit down and have something to share with you? And uh, she told me that he was trying to have hung himself, and he was gone. And I, I didn't know what to feel. I, in, in retrospect, understand that it, it puts you off balance emotionally so much that you don't know what to feel, even after, if you're lucky enough that the perpetrator does see justice, you still don't know what to feel because you've just thrown someone's life into chaos after that person threw your life in chaos. So here there are two victims of chaos and, and lack of mental health facilities that really can deal with this. We don't have a very good record in the United States. No, this. and that's all Reagan's fault, and we can, right. you know, trace yeah. it back to that, that's so, um, and it, 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 we'll definitely want, you touched on something really interesting I want to circle back to, um, so, as I'm getting these death and rape threats, and I, he started making websites about killing and raping me, I mean, this is, most people who are being stalked, and I, I want to differentiate stalking and harassment, like, it's different, mm -hmm. like, as you, you know, when you, stalking is, you know, a credible threat, an ongoing threat, to, you know, mm -hmm. versus somebody who's just, like, saying mean things. It's a, it's a very specific threat. Yeah, this guy said, stalk, kill, and eat me. Right, exactly. And because I had that letter, yeah. the DA took it well, seriously. But right. without that, I wouldn't have been right. able to get redress at all. Right, which is, cr which is, which is wild. So, um, you know, I'm sort of normalizing it, trying to get about my life, and then he sent my boss, my, my mentor in reality TV, a death threat, saying that if I worked there that he would 
you know, kill him and everybody there. And then everybody in my office had Googled Mike Stalker and saw that he tried to kill himself in Ivanka Trump's store. So everybody's afraid of workplace violence. That became a very tricky thing. And so I just didn't work there anymore. So then I go immediately to the police and I'm like, listen, I have tons, because usually with these crimes, it's like kind of he said, she said, or whatever the appropriate gender is. You know, I'm like, he has a website about killing and raping me. Like this is, I thought I had so much evidence. And they just said, oh, why don't you just dye your hair so you get less attention and go off the internet? And I, right. Incredible. And I said, well, okay, excuse me, well, Ivanka Trump is very conventional looking. Let's not even play this game. And you know what? I work in TV. So a week later, I, I'm like, I like, fuck you guys. I know producers. I'm not playing this game. So then I called my friend Bill Jensen, who, interestingly enough, he's the one who just um, finished for Michelle McNarm with the Golden State Killer book. I'm very proud of him. He's done so well in true crime. But he's an old friend of mine. And he put me on a show called Crime Watch Daily, where they team me up with this incredible woman, Rhonda Saunders, who was the ADA at the time of Rebecca Schaefer's murder. And she wrote not only California's first stalking laws, but the first stalking laws in the entire country. And she, Rhonda's amazing. And the the Californians were the first. Yeah, yeah we were, I, I remember the Rebecca Schaefer yeah. case very well. I was anchoring the news in Los Angeles when it happened. It's so terrible. It, I mean, to, to try to picture what happened it's so terrible. is beyond the pale. Yeah. And, and still it took how many decades after that? To come to even this point where you've been taken seriously after the guy builds a website about oh, harming you? Yeah, I mean, so, okay, so so Rhonda wrote those laws, and the thing is they have really, they got passed in 92, they really haven't been updated since. Think about what a different world we live in from 1992, nothing right? Si nothing cyber. Right, exactly. So that's why in California, one of the things we're trying to work on is an ankle monitor initiative, and I want to put ankle monitors on stalkers on probation that links to an app that I created, given to the victim, that would give you warning. It's like, let's say it's a thousand feet proximity, you go ding, 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 and it would tell you if they're, if it, right? Because I'm all about empowering the victim, because that we sure. have technology. We can, instead of, you know, because right, I help people, like, I helpful GPS trackers off cars. People can send you a link, you click on it, they get the GPS in your phone. Mm -hmm. So with this stuff, you can really turn it and make technology work for you mm -hmm. with things like Ring and Nest, like there's a lot of stuff. So, um, so at this point, the cops aren't doing anything. I go on that show, I team up with Rhonda, I tell her all my proposals. My friend Polly Perez from NCIS, she's had a stalker for very, like a bunch of years, and so she connected me with Congressman Schiff, who's amazing. I can't say enough nice things about yeah, him. He's so wonderful. Yeah. I mean, the fact that, and this is all before he was head of House Intelligence Committee, at a, like he's a right, local right. congressman. Progressive guy. So wonderful. And people don't realize that there's a rape test kit facil um, facility in, in Glendale that is only there because he wrote the grant. Like, he's just a wonderful person. So he would meet with me on Sunday, like he would, you know, do his dad stuff and show up with his, you know, his dad clothes and sit and like talk. <laughs> I, I love him. And he's the one who took my proposal to the Department of Justice. I mean, he's just wonderful. So I started working with him. and. Then we started filming the 48 Hours episode, and right. while we were doing that, you know, LAPD was telling me, like, oh, we can't find your stalker. And I'm like, really? Because he puts his phone number on the website about killing and raping me? Like, it's not that hard. So 48 Hours had an 18-year-old intern who was able to FaceTime with my stalker. It's on the episode. So I have the evidence of him being a total maniac. And so before this, when I had done TV, people would say, oh, you just want attention. I'm like, no, I'm on TV a lot on my own. I don't need this. Right. This is not like some weird thing. Mm -hmm. um, but now, when because that was like the number one show in America that week, everyone's like, oh, this is real and he's terrifying. And so um, Dr. Mahandi, who was a forensic psychologist on that episode, was like, no, she's right. He's really, really scary. So they had him put into a mental facility in Utah. Like the producers called and had it happen, not the LAPD here. So he goes to the mental facility, and finally I get a break from the constant rape and death threats. I'm like, Phew, okay. So then Trump wins, America's sad, you know, that's what happens. And then I'm walking my dog, and I get a call from the Secret Service. Secret right. Service has called me because my stalker has broken out of a mental facility. He talks like he's, like, uh, the Joker from Batman, like, no joke, can hold me. Well, apparently not, because he got out. So Secret Service called me. To did he break out, out, or was he released? No, he broke out. Okay. He, he got wow. out. He got out. So um, apparently it's been on the news in Utah where it happened, and no one had warned me because the states don't work together. So right, even though right. I'm the victim here, they don't interact. That's, that's a big part of the problem. Right. So I won the stalking lottery in that I shared the stalker with the president's daughter. So I thought, okay, I'm going to be the one person to benefit from him becoming the president because now mm -hmm. they're going to do something. So he's out on the loose, and I, you know, I turn on TMZ, and there I am, and it's really weird. And... Um, he was caught a block away from Trump Tower. He's not even allowed to be in New York for the terms of his probation. So I'm thinking, okay, he's going to get some real time. No, he got six weeks. Then he's out, and he's in L.A., and he's looking for me, and he went to my friend's salon looking for me, leaving notes. And 
he's writing all this horrible stuff, and by this point I'm with my fiance, who luckily is an entertainment lawyer, so he's used to craziness. So I didn't date for years because it's hard enough to be dating and sit down. I was, gonna, I was gonna ask, yeah. Yeah, you don't want to disclose, like, by the way, you're gonna, you know, so, uh, and plus I've known my fiance for 10 years, we were friends first, so um, he starts, like, harassing him, and it's getting really crazy,